Okay? Very good. All right. Today, we're going to continue our study of James, I think. Let me get this thing on. There we go. Use your words for good. Lots of parents tell their kids to use their words, don't they? But we're supposed to use our words. Now think of words for just a moment as things we use. Words are tools. Words are, are um, uh, there's something that we can put to use for one purpose or another. And um, in the book of James, he's talking about relationships and he's talking about difficulties in relationships and he's talking about how to use our words that'll end up in positive outcomes for relationships, not negative outcomes for relationships. So use your words for good. That's our challenge to each one of us today. Um, We've talked in the book of James about asking for God's wisdom and being open for that. We've talked in the book of James about listening. God says be quick to listen. Uh, We've talked in the book of James about being slow to speak. These are all great things for relationships. We've talked in the book of James about showing favoritism and how that destroys relationships rather than building relationships in the right way. Today we're in James 3. We're going to be talking about our words. I read all kinds of articles before teaching these, plus studying the book of James, which I've studied for years. But I ran across an interesting uh, article in Forbes magazine And it was talking about communication. And it said it takes three positive communication experiences to offset one negative experience. And some people say that it takes more than three. uh, Ten or something? Yeah. Yeah. And and my my spouse corrected me on that too and said, no, it takes more like ten or twelve. But anyway, it takes a lot of them to um, offset one negative experience. Um, Think about communication experiences. See, your experience, when when you are in some kind of communication with someone, and if you come away feeling negative or hurt or broken down or whatever, or angry or whatever, that's a negative experience. But a communication experience is shared by more than one person. Say, you and whoever the other people are, And so the same is true for the other person as it is for you. So as Christians, remember, um, James says, love your neighbors yourself. And that's the royal law. But Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? So in every communication experience, we're not only thinking of ourselves and the way that experience is affecting us, but we're thinking about the other person or person's that we're communicating with. So keep that in mind. All right, there were several quotes on this that I ran across this last week about words. And uh, these are a few of them, and I thought were good. Be mindful when it comes to your words. Now in James, he says simply be slow to speak. That means think before you talk. You know, take a few beats. Consider what you're going to say before you say it. We often just react or pop off, and that's usually not helpful. So be mindful when it comes to your words. A string of some that don't mean much to you may stick with someone else for a lifetime. That is very, very true. We often, in, in times future, we rehearse words that we've heard people say, and we repeat them to ourselves, especially if they've had some kind of an impact of us. Honest. That's Rachel Wolken. Be careful with your words. Once they are said, they can only be forgiven, not forgotten. <clears throat> well, that unknown guy or lady is pretty smart because that's true. You know, once we say them, we might forgive, but they're still there in our heads. Now, I like this one, Rumi. I don't know who that is, but uh, raise your words, not your voice. It is rain that grows flowers, not thunder. Hmm, I like that one. See? So raise your words. In other words, rather than 
letting our anger take over. And you remember James 1.19, be swift to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. So when we raise our words, we think carefully and we use words to express our feelings, but without the thunder, okay? Does the way we say things matter as much as what we say? It does, doesn't it? The way we say things, the tone that we have. Uh, sometimes uh, there, may be, there may be some, depending on your background, who are used to loud people. Uh, loud exchanges and that may not mean anything to you but <clears throat> in other people's view loud exchanges mean angry negative or even violent exchanges and so if our if our voice is raised uh, we may be taken to be aggressive you know so be careful I love this quote raise your words not your voice it is rain that grows flowers not thunder. I like that one. Whoever that roomie was. Uh, this one I forgot to put in red, Pearl struck and heard. Handle them carefully for words have more power than atom bombs. Well, that's true in a lot of ways. Mother Teresa said kind words can be short and easy to speak, but their echoes are truly endless. People need kind words. People need confidence-building words. People need compliments. People need words of appreciation. People need those to feed their souls. Um, in Ephesians chapter 4, <clears throat> let no corrupt speech proceed out of your mouth. I think it's verse 29. Let no corrupt speech proceed out of your mouth but such as is good for building people up that it may give grace to them that hear. Okay? Now, many of us, when we read that verse, it's Ephesians 4.29, I think. But many of us, when we read that verse, we think he's talking about naughty words like four-letter words. The passage has nothing to do with how many letters your words have. The passage has everything to do with whether your words are building people up or tearing people down. So the corrupt speech that he's talking about in Ephesians 4.29 is not four-letter words. It is speech that tears people down. It's speech that is like hitting someone. It is, it is hurtful speech, speech that does not edify so there are some people, the reason I'm making this point is there are some Christians who would not be saying any four-letter words, but by their berating of other people in non-four-letter words, they're the ones that are really disobeying God's command more than people who are kind who use four-letter words. Now, don't tell anybody I said that. But it seems to match up with what God's word actually says. You know, what makes a word, in God's eyes, bad? Well, if you really look at scripture, a bad word is a word that is hateful and mean and cuts other people down. A good word is a word that edifies or strengthens or builds other people up. See? That's the difference between bad words and good words. Then we could talk about culturally acceptable words, and we'd be getting into the four-letter word category, okay? I'm not recommending four-letter words. I'm just saying that our focus on four-letter words removes the focus from where it should be, and that is on words that build up rather than words that tear down, all right? So unknown, that smart person says again, words are seeds that do far more than blow around. It's, he's thinking of seeds that come off of trees and plants and everything. There are seeds that do more than blow around. Words land in our hearts and not the ground. Be careful what you plant and careful what you say. You might have to eat what you planted one day. It's actually a poem. It's a, it's a line from a poem. Say the first two sentences rhyme, the second 
two sentences, Ryan. But words are like seeds that are planted, and you might have to eat what you planted if you let those words out. That's true. I've had to eat my words a whole bunch of times. Anybody else besides me? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, take foot, insert in mouth. That's, that's me. All right, so this is challenging for all of us because one of the most difficult things to do in life is to, to truly do what James says is bridle your tongue. At the end of James 1, is it about verse 26? If a person claims to be religious but can't bridle his own tongue, you know, and back up in verse 19, he said, be swift to listen and slow to speak, you know, that is very difficult to do, isn't it? So let me ask you this. Can we bridle our tongues without being intentional about it? No. We have to actually think beforehand about it and actually control ourselves consciously in order to bridle our tongues, okay? Um, you know, in, in the book of James chapter 2 and chapter 1, he talks about being doers of the word and not hearers only. And as we've pointed out before, the context of James is that being a doer of the word means bridling your tongue. And it does mean being slow to speak. And it does mean being swift to listen. And it does mean all those things as well as the other things. Like if people are in need, helping those people in need. See, our deeds... This man will be blessed in his doing. Okay? So these are all good, thoughtful things for us. Betty Eady, whoever that is, if we understood the power of our thoughts, we would guard them more closely. If we understood the awesome power of our words, we would prefer silence to almost anything negative. That's worth thinking about. In our thoughts and words, we create our own weakness and our own strengths. Our limitation and joys begin in our hearts. We can always replace them with positive things. So our words need to be words that help people and situations and not words that hurt people and situations. And I don't know about you, but I'm trying, and I have a long ways to go, but I'm working on those things. All right, so, you know, in the book of James, in James chapter 3, and, and I hate chapters because when we read the Bible in chapters, we get the impression that we're starting new subjects, and we're not. James is continuing what he's been talking about from the very beginning. He's talking about a situation where there are Christians, like us, and yet there is a cultural conflict going on between uh, the employers and the employees, the owners and the workers, whatever it was, and both groups are represented as members of the church. And this very harsh conflict that's going on in the world around them is in, infecting the people in the church, okay? So he's inviting people to not just say they are Christians, but live their Christianity and their actions during this conflict, Okay? So in chapter 3, do not be many of you teachers, my brothers, for you should know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now many people, you know, when they, when they uh, read this passage, they want to talk about Bible class teachers and who can teach little children. And all that. You know, that's fine, but this point is in this passage that in the midst of this conflict, wherever you're a teacher... Wherever, wherever you're an influencer, I can't even use that word today, can I? Influencer. Because if I use that word, people think I'm talking about social media, which is also, by the way, a place that we can use our influence. But he's talking about people that would be influential in a teaching way in the church, okay, during this time of conflict, okay? So we can pour... Uh, oil on the waters, you know, or we can set the whole place on fire because whoever is in those roles, wherever they are, they influence other people, okay? So um, he says, 
We all stumble in many ways, but if any man does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man. The word perfect means complete here. Able to bridle his whole body. Now, take this verse, if, you're op- if your Bible is open, take this verse, go back to James 1.26 as a reference, and see that James 1.26 says, if you think you're religious but don't do what? Bridle your tongue... Your religion is vain, see? So these two verses are connected together. We need to be very careful. Uh, To bridle our tongue does not mean not to say anything. It means to control it. See, what's a bridle? A bridle is something you put on a what? A horse. All right? So um, he says if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, We guide their whole bodies as well. A horse is a horse, of course, of course. Wait a minute. That's a whole different thing. Yeah. Do you know where that's from, Letter Vissy? That's from Mr. Ed. Didn't you ever watch Mr. Ed on TV? Wilbur. Yeah. Some of you remember Mr. Ed. But you, you see the steel thing in the horse's mouth there? That's his bit, okay? And, of course, you have to have a bit that fits the mouth of the horse properly and all those other things if it's going to be correct, right, Michael? And so the, the, the thing is all structured so that, you know, when you pull on the reins or when you turn the reins, that bit moves up on the right or up on the left, and it, it tells the horse what to do, see? Horses are big. I used to think when I was a little boy in Wyoming that horses were huge and they're way up there. And they'd set me up on top of a horse and I thought that was huge, a horse. But it was big. And that, you know, the turning of them, you turn the whole body of the horse. Why is is James saying this? He's saying this because a person who talks to other people in the church and has influence is like a person riding the horse that can turn the whole horse, the, the whole group of people, one direction or the other by his what? By his words. See? And so that is, that is a huge responsibility for good or evil that cannot be taken for granted. Because we'll be held responsible for the evil that we do and for the good that we do. So... So the the tongue is like that bit that controls the whole body of the horse. He also says in the next verse, it's like the little rudder on a ship. Now back then, the ships weren't as big as they are now, but look at this big boy out there somewhere. I wonder how deep you'd have to have it for him not to scrape the bottom. It'd have to be bigger than all y'all's ponds and lakes and everything by a good long shot, but... See that rudder down there, that tiny rudder that is moved this way or that way by the steering turns that entire humongous ship one way or another. So the tongue of a person of influence turns the entire group of people, whatever group of people, one way or the other. Now, the tongue of a mother or a father turns a family's mind sometimes one way or another. The tongue of, of a, uh, a friend might turn a group of friends one way or another. Uh, the, the tongue of uh, a respected person at the workplace may turn other people one way or another. You know, So great ships are turned about by a very small rudder. We all need to realize that we have power in our tongues. It's a dangerous power. I mean, put, put one of your grandbabies or one of your babies on your knee and look into that precious face and, and realize that what you say or what, what they hear you say even when you're talking to other people has a profound effect on that little child and how that little child thinks so it's a big deal that we're talking about 
All right, so James says in verse 3, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships as though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So think of it this way. We are the pilot. We are deciding by the use of the rudder, by the use of our tongue, where we're going to direct the ship of people around us. Well, where do you want to direct people? In your family, among your friends. What do you want them to direct towards? What do you want them directed towards? Uh, I, I think of Colossians 4 verse 5, I think, or 6. Colossians 4 verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. But again, you don't do that accidentally. Am I wrong? That simply doesn't happen naturally. You have to intend it so and to work at it. Now, is it worth working at? It is. It is worth working at. Um, somebody said to me, and, and I had to process this, in many cases, the, the object of conversation is not to be right, not to be proved right. And I take that to mean that if I, if I must be proved right in every conversation, then I probably will uh, be aggressive and, and not leave the door open when I leave the, con uh, the, the conversation. But if I simply am kind and I ask questions to help the other person think and leave the door open at the end of the conversation so that I still have influence toward what is right, see, then I've succeeded because I've saved the relationship and I have not failed because I've closed the door on the relationship. Is that fair enough? Because you know that I believe in right and wrong, but... But if I, if I am too aggressive in the way I do something and I close the door, then I never have any more influence with somebody to help them uh, see for themselves what is right and what is wrong. And I think that makes a great deal of sense. Anybody want to raise a comment at this point? Yes, ma'am. What you don't say, you don't have to take back. That was her mom's advice. That's good advice. It's very good advice. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, this is how do you communicate what you need to communicate and at the same time leave the door open. See, that's a, that's a struggle for all people in church relationships, whatever it, it might be. All right, so he says... Uh, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. Now, he's talking about the dangers here of the tongue. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Now, notice that. I saw something I've never seen before in that verse. Notice it says, setting on fire, and then set on fire. So, the tongue is something that sets fires among people, meaning it, it, it exacerbates conflict. It, it stokes the fires of conflict. But that tongue that is setting the fire has been set on fire by some source. And he says it's by the devil. It's by hell. So does Satan tempt us in regard to the use of our tongues. Absolutely, absolutely. Every man is tempted, chapter 1, when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So in this situation, in this conversation, whatever it is, what is your desire? Is your desire dominance over a person? Is your desire 
uh, vindication is your desire for justice to be done, to punish the other person is your desire for harmony to be restored, for kindness to prov- What's your desire, see? But every man is tempted when he's drawn away by his negative desires and enticed. Anger, jealousy. We talked about those things in a previous lesson. And desire, you know, uh, when it proceeds, brings forth sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. So I can set a fire with my tongue. But if I do, my tongue has been set on fire by Satan, by the temptations of the devil. And I have to realize that that's the truth. So what would God want me to do? And James said, well, you, you, you asked for my wisdom and I gave it to you. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. James 1.19. If, if you didn't want my wisdom, why would you ask for it? You know. So... Every time I read this book, I'm convicted again. Um, And I I realize that, yes, I've been working on these things in my life, but yes, I need to work on them a whole lot more in in my life. Okay? He says, but no human being, every, every kind of beast and bird, reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. You know, I have thought in my youth how cute some wild creatures are and how it would be nice to, to make them pets. And the old men who knew what they were talking about said, no, that's not a pet right there. And if you're not careful, you're going to find out that that's not a pet, you know, when it grows up. So the tongue is like that. The tongue is, is that type of creature that you can't really turn your back on it and take it for granted or it'll get away from you. And if it doesn't bite you, it'll bite somebody else. Okay? Anybody? Okay. With it, that's that tongue, we bless our Lord. You know, we come in here and Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Now, bless and curse. Let's talk about that for a minute again. Bless means to praise or thank. Curse means to, and actually bless, in some cases, is to pray for somebody else. But a curse is is asking that bad things be done to people. See, So we can't bless the Lord and curse his creatures at the same time. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not so to be. Well, that's true. So does a spring pour forth from the same opening fresh and salt water? What's the answer to that one? Nope. Uh, Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grape? Vine produce figs. Well, that's a uh uh-uh. Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. It just doesn't happen. So what's your point, James? Well, his point is that what comes out of our mouth betrays what? Our heart, our mind. And that everything that comes out of our mouth comes from our mind. Now... um, Well, I'm going to leave that there. Let's see. Yeah, wait a minute. Back one. There. Now, wait a minute. Right there. Okay, this comes from Jesus. What relationship was Jesus to James? He was his brother. What were Jesus' four brothers' names? James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. 
and Judas wrote the book of Judas, but we don't want to call it that. We call it the book of Jude because we don't want to confuse him with Judas Iscariot. But Jesus had a brother named Judas who wrote the book of Jude, and his brother James wrote the book of James, okay? So James's brother Jesus said this in Matthew 12, 32, either make the tree good, or 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. Okay, what kind of tree are we? Well, what kind of fruit do we bear? You brood of vipers, said Jesus, how can you speak good things when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good things. The evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil things. So, I have a very bad habit. I think out loud. I even talk to myself sometimes. Do any of y'all do that? No, I guess I am weird with a capital W. But I talk to myself sometimes when I, and I think through things even out loud, okay? And sometimes my thoughts come out before I have time to stop them and, and uh, think better of it. But the, the content of our mind comes out of our mouth. The, wor the word heart here means your mind, okay? And then Jesus says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless or idle word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. See, the title of our lesson is Use Your Words for Good. Use them for good. We can control what comes out of our mouth. But we have to do it intentionally, right? So do I have to be intentional? Let's, let's discuss this for a minute. Do I really have to be intentional about every single conversation I have in the whole wide world? Who wants to speak up on that? Okay, not necessarily as long as you're not tearing somebody down. Could we say that there may be some environments that are so relaxed to us that we don't feel like tearing anybody down and so we don't have to be as intentional about that? Yeah? Barry, speak up, bro. Okay, so he says it's, 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 if we are left to our nature, it's, it's often going to be negative. That's true. But what if we're really trying to be good communicators and everything, but in certain situations we just let our guard down, and then in that situation where we've let our guard down, uh, there comes up some sort of a struggle or a conflict, then what? We'd be taken by surprise. Yes, ma'am. Amen. All right, she says, for those of you that didn't hear, we need to read our own body signals and our own emotions and take, keep track of those. And if we realize we're angry, uh, then we need to really say to ourselves, I'm angry and I need to really watch my words and I need to control my words and maybe not say anything. Did I get the gist of what you were trying to say? So if I'm angry or if I'm agitated or if I'm anxious or whatever, I need to read my own 
self. Be aware of myself. Chuck? Yeah. So Chuck's comment is that we have to think carefully before we speak, and it has to be the truth, but it can't be vindictive, and we, we have to be careful with what we say. Barry? Yes, and, and many things that we might disagree on are not matters of Scripture, right? They're things that may be neither here nor there. Mm-hmm. I think uh, the, the words of thoughts, you know, you also on the you're with. Okay, expand. he says your words and thoughts may depend on the company you're with. All right, so what you're saying, if I understand you correctly, is that you have understandings between you and your brother where you might say things to him that wouldn't bother him, but if you were around somebody else, it might bother them. That's true. Very true. Oh, Brandon Morgan. Absolutely. For those of you that didn't hear Brandon, he said, we're talking about spoken words, but we also need to apply this to anything written out or texts or whatever. I hate texts. Why do I hate texts? Well, yeah, you can't see the person that you're speaking to. You, 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 you may do a, I like brevity in texts. Boom, boom, boom. That's it. And sometimes the brevity in my texts may sound like I'm being short or something or being, you know, so I hate texts. If I'm going to write something, I like to have room to write it out in an email so I can better express my feelings. But yes, texts. Yes, this is good. Yes, ma'am, sir. Yeah, you, Chuck. <laughs> I thought you were a girl for a minute. No, not really. Now oh, that's a word, sorry. Yes, his his comment is great. He says we need to pick our battles. He says, if somebody says something to you that you really disagree with, is it that important to um, make a conflict or make a battle out of it? I think a lot of times with our children or grandchildren or with other people, we really need to pick our battles. That's right, because we might, as we talked about earlier, we might be shutting a door at that moment that we really don't want to shut. So, yeah, that's very good. Any of you others, this is good discussion. Yes, J.V. Curley. Okay, that's a great comment. He said, some things may be true and they may be right, but they don't need to be said. Maybe they don't need to be said at that moment or something like that. But yes, you're exactly right. Because they don't help. All right, this is very good. All of this is good. All right. So, do you want to get into a brand new subject at 10, at 10 12, and we've got three more? I, I, how many no's? All the hands go up, no. Let's go ahead and break, and uh, we'll see you at church, Lord willing.